Well, hello, everybody. It is your favorite day of the week. Another day of a lifetime of Hallmark. I am Les Kirkendall Barrett. Hello, Jason Bowers. Hello, Les Kirkendall Barrett. And hello, Kirk Fitzpatrick. Hello, Les Kirkendall Barrett. And hello, Jason Bowers. We take movies from both Lifetime and the Hallmark Channel and try to make sense of them. We're not very successful, though, because they don't often make sense, but they are fun to watch. And we go down all kinds of rabbit holes. We talk about Angelion quite a bit. We talk about the show Enos. June uh, Squibb. We, we are we are team June Squibb oh, all the way. And we have Black China news every single episode. So with that in mind, why don't you listen to A Lifetime of Hallmark? You can listen wherever you get your favorite podcasts. This is a Kirkendall Barrett presentation. <laughs> Well, hello, everybody. It is time for the Reality Reading Rainbow, where I talk about books written by reality stars, primarily those from Bravo, and I try to make sense of them. I also do interviews, too. Now, my name is Les Kirkendall Barrett, and I am your host, and thank you for joining me for another episode. This week, we are going to be talking about the book Bevelations by Bevy Smith. Or actually, it's called Bevelations. Wait, let me let me look up the the exact. I gotta I gotta do this book justice because I loved this book. So let me. I need to I need to get the I need to get the title correct here because this actually honestly was one of my favorite one of my favorite books. Oh, so. So the exact title, because I want you guys to order this book on Kindle, either order it on Kindle or go out and buy it, because this book, honestly, and I'm not just saying this, this book is a must read, especially if you are someone who is in your late 30s or older, this book is a, is seriously a must read. I really loved this book. So the book is called... Bevelations by Bevy Smith. Lessons from a mother, a be- an auntie, a bestie. And this, seriously, I think out of all of the books that I have read for this podcast, this honestly, hands down, is one of my favorites. Um, and I know I promised to stop talking about Erica Jane's shitty book. But I will say this, and then um, I will try not to talk about Erica Jane's shitty book anymore. This book, Bevelations, is everything that um, Erica Jane's shitty book wished that it was. Seriously. This book, this book, actually for me, while reading this book, actually, um, just really pointed out all of the glaring bullshit that Erica Jane's book was because this book, Bevelations, is literally doing a service. It's helpful to anybody middle-aged who who discovers in their middle age that they want to um, that they want to go for their dreams. This book was encouraging, very encouraging when it came to that. And Erica, Erica's book could have done like this humongous service just because of the fact that she was a middle-aged woman. Erica was a middle-aged woman who decided that she wanted to be a singer. And even though it was bought by her husband, she could have still like used it to turn it around and be helpful to someone other than her own ego. Bevy's book, I'm happy to say, did this. If you're a person 
who is in middle, who's middle aged and decide that you want to go for your goals and you want to go for your dreams and you want to turn your life around and live the life that you were meant to lead. Bevelations is the book for you because Bevy um, tells her real life story and it is, it is such an interesting story. So, so basically, um, oh, I'm going to explain Bevy's title. Um, so, you know, it's called Bevelations, Lessons from a Mother, and she spells it M-U-T-H-A, <laughs> an auntie or a bestie. And she said the reason why she put this in her title is because she's, she says a mother because her, she, you know, she has a lot of gay friends and she takes a lot of gay uh, young people under her wing. And so she calls them her gay adopted kids and they call her mother. She says that she put auntie in the title because she has a lot of friends, um, a lot of uh, friends, both male and female, who tell Bevy that she reminds them of their cool aunt. So, which uh, honestly... Okay, Bevy and I are around the same age. Bevy, yeah, I think I might even be a little older than Bevy because, yeah, Bevy's 54. I'm 54 as well, but I'm going to turn 55 in April. So I'm not sure if I'm older, but I, Bevy and I are around the same age. But, but that being said, Bevy says that she reminds her friends of their favorite auntie. Bevy actually reminds me <laughs> of my favorite auntie too. She does. <laughs> Bevy totally reminds me of like a, one of my favorite aunties. So that's why she put auntie in the title. And a bestie. Because um, a lot of people say that Bevy, just her, her energy makes, makes her feel feel makes people very comfortable being around her and I have got to say and I'm not just saying this when I finished reading this book the first thing I wished is I wished that I could that Bevy I wanted to be her friend Bevy is a person who I would totally be friends with her we would totally go to a bar I could see us going to a bar to look at men you know, she'd be looking at the straight men. I'd be looking at the game. And well, I, let's come, I'd be looking at the game, but I'd be looking at the straight ones too. Let's not get this twisted. You know, Bevy, but I could see Bevy and I. Bevy and I go into a bar together, you know. Bevy talks about how she likes to eat and she does not hide that. And she's very proud of her curvy figure. So I could picture it this way. Bevy and I would go to a, Bevy and Les would go to a bar. You know, Bevy would order champagne. I would order order ginger ale because I don't drink. Bevy would order some chicken wings. I would order like a veggie burger because I don't eat meat. But the one thing that Bevy and I would have in common is we would probably be eyeing up all of the same men. <laughs> and it would be Fun. Oh my God. Okay. I just remembered something. This, and this is the problem with doing a, a podcast by myself. I have another podcast, uh, A Lifetime of Hallmark, by the way, that I do with two co-hosts. And the cool thing about having a co-host or two when you do a podcast is there's always someone around to remind you about shit that you forgot. I totally forgot to mention a couple of things. First of all, I have a Patreon account. And um, on my Patreon account, uh, I, first of all, um, first of all, I use the money that I make uh, from the Patreon account to, to buy books, including this one. The, book, the money that I paid to buy this book was uh, from Patreon money. So I use the money to buy books and there's different tiers and there's different perks for people um, who um, donate on Patreon. Um, uh, there are different tiers that range anywhere from $3 a month, and I mean a month, $3 a month to $20 a month. It's just, you know, I know that times are tough for everyone. 
So, um, you know, I get it. If you don't have money and it's not a requirement, I would rather have you listen. Um, you know, of course, we all would like the money, but if you don't have the money, that's not a requirement. I, I'm just happy that you're listening and I'm just happy to, to be a source of entertainment for you. But I am bad about marketing. So, um, so I, I am mentioning it now. You know what else I want to do? I want to take this time, and I learned this little trick from, from my buddies Ben and Ronnie over at um, uh, Watch What Crappens, you know. Or as I, I, I they, they, Ben and Ronnie don't know this, but I do consider Ben and Ronnie mentors of mine. Just because, you know, if it wasn't for Watch What Crappens, I wouldn't even have a podcast. But I'm trying to stretch for time here because I want to do something just to show my appreciation. I want to, I want to thank my current patrons who are giving, um, who are giving support. Oh, here we go. So I now want to take time to personally thank some of my active patrons. So I hope you're ready to blush because I'm going to call you out and mention you by name because I really appreciate your support. So um, I would like to thank my patrons, Thea Castro, Hava Weber, Jessica Riley, Cassie Roy, uh, Madame's, the Madame's Hose and Gigolos podcast. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your support. And I really appreciate it. There are a lot of perks. One of the perks, which I'm really looking forward to, is our book club meeting. And we are going to have our first book club meeting at the end of the month, and that is for top tier members. And what we do is we pick a book, one of the books that have been read this month, it's going to be the, Ho- the House of Hilton. And we just literally have a good old fashioned gossip session about it. You don't even need to read the book. Um, you just need to show up and, and, and have listened to the podcast. And, you know, uh, we'll sit back, we'll talk, we'll gossip. In this case, it's Ho- House of Hilton. So I'm sure we'll have a lot of big Kathy info to talk about. But it's a good time. So in the future, if you can if you can swing a couple of bucks, become a member. And like I said before, if you can't, then, hey, I'd rather you just listen and support me through your listens and your downloads, because that counts, too. Now, back to Bevy Smith. Anywho, where did I lead off? Oh, OK. So Bevy's book, which I love, is basically is literally just kind of how to turn it all around for yourself, how to have a con- how to have a career change um, in midlife, and basically how to leave a life where you're just kind of um, barely making it through the day. And when I say barely making it, I don't mean financially. But I mean, emotionally, you know, a day where you're going to a job day in and day out, but it's a job that you hate and you're not feeling fulfilled and you're not getting your best out of life. This is a book how to leave that life behind and create a new life for yourself where you're going to uh, a uh, where you you know you have a career that is fulfilling to you, that you're doing the things that you want to do, that you're creating the life that to create your happiest and best life. That is what this book is all about. And what I like about this book too is A, Bevy doesn't sugarcoat it. She doesn't blow smoke up, up your ass. She she isn't the type that tells you, oh, if you do this and this and this and this and this, it's going to be really easy and it's going to happen overnight. No, she does not do that. She actually gives good realistic information and um, like for example so Bevy basically decided at 38 years old so basically so Bevy starts out the book 
she's got this great job. She's in Italy because at the time she was in the fashion industry. So she's at like a fashion event in Milan. She's at the top of her game in her job at the time. You know, she had drivers. She had an expense account. She had assistants. You know, she was traveling around the world, literally, and she was not happy. And so she kind of had like a mini, a mini breakdown um, while she was on a business trip. Or as she likes to call it, and I like this word, she called it a malaise. She was experiencing a, a malaise. You know, she says that malaise sounds better than depression, which is right. And um, it, it, malaise does sound better than depression. And she said that she was trying everything that she possibly could to get rid of it. You know, shopping, sex, other things. And it just was not helping. And she finally admit to her, she finally had to admit to herself that she wasn't happy with the life that she had. And she wasn't happy with her career trajectory, even though in her career field, she was successful. And so she decided to make a change. And so she had a good, long, hard talk with herself. And she created this manifesto and decided that she was going to go after what she wanted and create the life that she wanted. And she said, okay, so I'm going to do this and I'm going to create a change. And it happened overnight, right? Wrong. It took her seven years after she made this decision to achieve her dreams. And it was seven years of hard work. She like at one point ran out of money. Um, She, you know, at one point she had to sell clothes on consignment to make ends meet. And she really had to struggle. And you know what ended up turning her career around. And this is where Bravo comes into play. She was struggling and pursuing her goals and pursuing her career. And she was at the point where she was thinking, I've given this, you know, she's like, cause she, her goal was to be like a, a writer, uh, actor, television host, just something creative. And she was at the point where she was almost at the end of her rope and she had run out of money and she had been kind of beaten down and she was getting sick of it. And she was at the end of her rope. And then she was discovered by Andy Cohen and booked Fashion Queens. And Fashion Queens is what turned her career around and created the the trajectory that she's on today. Um... So, so, um, so she has a lot of, so her book definitely comes across as genuine because she's talking about stuff that she had really been through herself, right? And so she talks a little bit about her past. Um, oh, oh, back to when she decided to change her life in that Italian hotel room, she literally wrote um, um, a a manifesto of sorts on hotel stationery. And she really gave her, she really took a good hard look at herself. And, you know, she wrote about what made her happy. She wrote about what made her sad. She wrote about what ways that she felt inauthentic. You know, she realized that she had been living her life for the approval of others. And she had been living her life looking for validation outside of herself and not inside of herself. And she was doing things that she was told that she was supposed to do. And she was going for stuff because she was told by society that she was supposed to go for these things, but they all weren't things that she authentically uh, wanted for herself. And P.S., the, the, the thing that I learned the most from this is she was, when she was going through this, she was a successful woman. And she 
realized that, yeah, she was successful, but success didn't solve any of her problems. And so she went back and she started from from square one. And did I say it took her seven years to execute her plan? It did not take her seven. I got to correct myself. It took her five. But still, five years, seven years. It wasn't overnight. It, it, it wasn't overnight at all. Um, one of the another the, uh, one of the other cool things that she said that was very realistic is when she decided to make this change. She, um, she didn't have the luxury of just upping and quitting her job. Now, she wanted to make the change, but she was a single woman who was supporting herself, and at the time. She was uh, supporting her parents, too. She, she had responsibilities, so she couldn't up and just quit this job because she had people counting on her. So she had to continue to work and fabricate this whole new plan while she was working to put food on the table. Um, she really... Oh, what it, so she said one of the first things she did, because... Bevy's um, name is Beverly Smith. And so one of the first things that she did, because this was one of the things that she had control over and didn't have to quit her job to do, was she changed her, her name from Bevy, from Beverly, from Beverly Smith to Bevy Smith. And so she started having everybody call her Bevy. And this was the new person that she wanted to be, Bevy Smith. Um, so she, um, so, so she won, so this, and this was her first step to getting, to, to forming a new identity. And so, you know, she, she had this plan to change her life. She started, you know, so she started changing her life. Now, at the time, she was, um, she had a successful job over at Rolling Stone magazine. And so when she did go in and quit Rolling Stone, her boss looked at her like she was crazy because her boss is like, well, wait, so what are you going to do when you quit? And when she's like, you know, I want to, I want to, I want a life in entertainment. I want to write. I want to act. I want to be a presenter. And she said, like, basically her boss and other people like literally looked at her like she was crazy. But, you know, she had to, she had to do what she had to do. So uh, one of, so, um, uh, so, so she says, she says a lot of cool things, or as she calls them, bevelations. One of the things that she talks about is having a, a good mindset and that it's all about good mindset and that like, if you think you're going to fail, you will probably fail. So um, she talks about that, you know, that you have to, that you have to believe in yourself um, or you're not going to get anywhere. Oh, so another part that I found interesting is she talks about um, how there are different parts of her. Um, like, or she breaks it down into many, like she says that her life, she's had several lives. Like when she was younger, when she was a kid, she calls um, that phase of her life the little brown bevy phase where she was like this nerdy, shy, socially awkward girl who um, she tells a story about how she wanted to fit in with the popular girls. And so by trying to fit in with the popular girls, she kind of gave away her core self because she says she considers the little brown Bevy, the little brown nerdy girl who reads a lot and knows about travel. She, she said that she kind of gave that part of her away when she vied to be one of the popular girls. And she says to this day, the little brown bevy persona, that is who she is at her core. 
Then the next phase is, uh, she called it the, the MC Bevsky stage, right? Um, the next stage, she calls it the Big Bev, the Big Bev from Uptown stage. And this was actually a very interesting stage in her life because Bevy was like, she had a corporate job by day, but she was heavily involved in the ground floor of the rap world. So by day, she was like this corporate woman, but by night, she would go hanging out with rappers and running, running around to rap clubs. And, and um, she knew a lot of, of famous rappers. And so she said that she kept it compartmentalized until... One day, well, oh, I think she was working at Vibe because she worked at Rolling Stone magazine and she was also worked at Vibe magazine. And so she said that she was keeping the world compartmentalized. I think it was Vibe. I am not sure. I know it was one of them. She goes into her magazine job and one of the rappers that she knew from the rap world was like in her boss's office and yelled out from her boss's office, Bev, what the fuck are you doing here? And so, <laughs> and so that's when she realized she kind of had to combine the two worlds. And then her, and then the next phase was called her Beverly Smith fashionista phase. And that is when Beverly or Bevy, can I call her Beverly? I'm sorry, Bevy. That's when Bevy like really, um, uh, started having, like, a really good career in the fashion industry, you know? So, um, but I like that she, like, broke it down because at the time, whatever phase she was at, this was, like, her authentic self at this time in her life. And, but she says that at the end of the day, her first, her first, um, the Little Brown Bevy, per, uh, that is where she is at, at her core. And I, as a reader, me, Les Kirkendall Barrett, I personally related to the um, Little Brown Bevy persona myself because I kind of have, you know, a similar, a similar sort of persona. You know, I was a shy kid. I was a nerdy kid. And then I decided that I wanted to fit in with the popular kids. And so I basically had to kind of dumb myself down to do that. Um, and, and so I really, I, that part really, uh, resonated with me. Um, so, um, another thing that I liked too is Bevy is really realistic. Like, you know, a lot of these, these books or these self-help books is like, you know, you're gonna just hang in there and you're gonna want to do things no matter what. Where Bevy is like, no, sometimes you don't feel like doing this shit. And sometimes you don't feel well. And sometimes you're not, you're not going to be happy 100% of the time. And that's okay. Um, she also talks a lot about basically when it comes to your life and it comes to your career, figure out what's going to work for you. And... That was another thing I liked about this book, too. It was like, you know, she's all about figure out what's going to work for you and what's going to work for me is not going to work for you. And so you got to carve your own path. You got to reevaluate and you've really got to just, you know, be you and 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 figure out things that are going to work for you, period. So, um so, oh, so Bevy loves, Bevy is an avid traveler. She says that she learned about travel from her father. She said like when she was a little kid, her dad um, used to give them geography, ge like teach geography quizzes at home and, and teach them about going to different countries. And so she learned about travel to her dad, from her dad. She loves to travel. She loves to vacation alone, which I thought was really cool. And she says there's, there's nothing more empowering than going on a vacation by yourself. Um, even if you can't afford to Europe and just can afford to go to the next town over and get a hotel or something, she, like, she says it's, it's, it's just really cool because 
it's helped her just become a more independent person. Oh, she talks about like when she worked for places like Rolling Stone and she was in the fashion industry. What I found interesting is like, for example, you would think Rolling Stone, since it's about the music industry, that it would be ethnically diverse, right? Wrong. She said when she was at Rolling Stone on the editorial side, there was um, there were very few black people. She said she was on the sales team at Rolling Stone and she was the only black person on the sales team, which I was kind of taken aback by because I automatically think music industry, of course, it's it's diverse. But no, it was not. She said that vibe... Um, that after Rolling Stone, she went to Vibe magazine. And of course, that is a hip hop oriented magazine. So, um, so that was, you know, of course, more diverse for her. Uh, she then, um, oh, and then she was saying also too, in a way, back or as uh, or as she put it, Rolling Stone had no use for civil rights or integration. And she said she didn't say it was a racist. She didn't say it was a racist environment. But at the same time, it was not equipped for a person of color. And they weren't really prepared to have people of color there. Now... Um, oh, oh, another thing that she said about working in Rolling Stone, because on paper, this was supposed to be like her dream job. And she equated Rolling Stone with like being in purgatory. And she said her whole purpose was she was going to go to Rolling Stone because they had a really good, like if you worked for a year or so and you had a certain amount of sales, you'd get like a five figure bonus. So she said, literally, she went to Rolling Stone with a plan of lasting long enough to get her five-figure bonus, but she called Rolling Stone purgatory. And I like here, because one of the things she says is, hey, sometimes a job is just a job, you know? And, she can, and so she said Rolling Stone for her was like just a job. You know, she says, sometimes you're going to go to a job, you're not going to find your tribe, you're not going to connect with anybody, and sometimes it's just a check. And sometimes if it's a good paying job, sometimes you need to do that to get the check, to give yourself the resources and the money that you need to get yourself to that next level. And so there's nothing wrong with that as long as it's a temporary thing. She says, as long as it's temporary and like you have like an exit plan and an out, then that's okay. But make sure you just don't get yourself stuck there. Um, she said, of course, you know, don't take no for an answer. You've got to have that attitude. Oh, she also talks about make sure you save your money and make sure you do your taxes. Because, um, at what, oh, and, and she kind of goes into this a little bit, how, um, like she talks about how being a shopaholic is a thing. And a lot of times people use being a shopaholic as a way to cover what's really going on with them. A lot like alcoholism or a lot like drug use. But she says the problem is, is that a lot of times people try to use the word like being a shopaholic as sort of a cutesy thing or as a way just to kind of peg out on women like, oh, she's a shopaholic. When in reality, shop, being a shopaholic is a really serious thing. And being, shop, being a shopaholic can get you into huge trouble financially. And she said, like, one of, she said one of the rude awakenings for her was she had these jobs like at Rolling Stone or Vibe or other jobs at the fashion in, in the fashion industry where she would, you know, she'd have an expense account. She would be able to go to all these exotic locales, but she was flown there for work. And a lot of times she'd be flown somewhere for work and then the work would allow her to tack on some extra days for her to go on another trip or whatever. But she said it was a rude awakening 
when she was done with these jobs and had no expense account anymore. And she basically said that like her spending habits were pretty fucked up because she didn't know any better. And so she had to learn, she had to learn how to save. She had to learn how to spend. Um, she said there was a point that she really did like, you know, run out of money and she turned that situation around because she used that to become an entrepreneur. And she said what she did is she started this company where she would throw dinner parties and what she would, because she used her connections because she had connections to these big brands in the fashion world. But at the time, I don't want to use the word racist, but at the time, these big brands were not taking rappers or other artists, other artists of color seriously. So what she started doing is she started throwing these dinner parties where she would connect a rapper with a big named label, uh, like a big name fashion label or a big name business and kind of put them together. And she'd have these dinner parties and then charge the person for the dinner party, you know, like $3,000, $4,000 for this dinner party. And she started making income that way, you know? So, and she said that was purely out of necessity because... She didn't have any money. Like, she'd run out of money. She needed to make money. She didn't want to have to go back to yet another corporate job. And so that was something that she did to survive. Oh, my God. Okay, so Bevy did something that I do. And it's something that I highly re recommend. Okay, so there's this book called The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. And actually, I'm looking at the book right now. The book is called The Artist's Way. It's written by Julia Cameron. You can get it uh, at a bookstore or since we are, you know, it is COVID. And so we're not going to bookstores that much. You can order it on Amazon. You can either get a hard copy or you could get it on Kindle. I recommend having a hard copy of it. And it's called The Artist's Way, The Spiritual Path to Higher Creativity. And Bevy said one of the things that helped her change her life is doing the artist's way. And I, Les Kirkendall Barrett, too, have done the artist's way. And I attribute it 100% uh, with, you know, because I personally have had a change in my life and in my career. And I'm currently, you know, pursuing a career in, in entertainment and I write and I perform and this podcast is one of the things that, you know, podcasting is another thing that is a career change for me. And it's all because of doing this book, The Artist's Way. So I highly, highly, highly recommend it. Highly. And she says this is one of the things that changed her life, too. So I was like, oh, Bevy. She says another book that Bevy recommends is a book called The Four Agreements. And she says that the book, uh, The Four Agreements, has really changed her life, too, because um, there are four points that The Four Agreement talks about, which she tries to live her life by. And the four points are, um, number one, oh, once again, the book is called The Four Agreements. I have it at a hard, on, a hard, um, on my bookshelf, but you can also get that on Amazon. But, okay, but The Four Agreements are... Number one is um, be kind with your word. So don't be catty. Don't be bitchy. Uh, don't take anything personally. Be authentically yourself. Oh. Uh, oh, I'm getting this mixed up. Let me start this again. The four agreements are be kind uh, with your word. So, yeah, don't be bitchy or mean or anything like that. Um, don't make assumptions. Um, so, yeah, don't make assumptions. Do your best. And, yeah, be authentically yourself. 
those are the four agreements. And she says that she, she uses that a lot and that like helps her as well. And of course, you know, she talks about believing in your power, uh, make, you know, make sure that you believe in yourself because she says that, you know, oh, and then she points out something which I agree with, you know, she says that sometimes black women who are in touch with their power are seen as a threat or they're accused of being angry or, you know, people, uh, you know, sometimes when a black woman uh, 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 owns her power, people try to dismiss her or, or call her the angry black woman or call her too loud or too pushy or, you know, all the other bullshit when actually she's just owning who she is and, you know, um, she's owning her power. Um, what else did she say? So, so, oh, so I, so Bevy has, you know, Bevy has had all, a lot of adventures. She's, she has lovers. She calls them her lovers and she loves having them. She, she, um, she tells this one story that was really funny about how, like, she went on this, she went on this vacation and I won't give away what it is. She went away from this vacation. She was having an issue. It was a painful issue, but she had, an, she had a layover in LA. Like I think she was on her way to Hawaii or something and wanted to get laid. And even though she was having this issue, she went and got laid by the sexy guy anyway. <laughs> there are a lot of stories like that. But Buffy, you know, Bevy, Bevy, Definitely knows how to have fun. Oh, when she's a kid, she talks about how she grew up in Harlem. She still lives in Harlem to this day. I think she actually, like, owns her apartment. She owns her place there. Um, um, she, oh, she, then she talks about the fact that, you know, when she was in high school, she's happy that she did not peak in high school because she did... She did know people who did peak in high school. Um, she considers herself lucky because when she was in the working world, she had a lot of people in the working world who took them to took her under their wing. And especially she said in a lot of cases, because when she first started out, it wasn't that it was not as common is as it is now for a black woman to work her way up the ranks. And so she said that a lot of people, especially quite a few white people, actually took Bevy under their wing and really helped her and really encouraged her as a strong black woman to work her way up the ranks. And um, they were very, very encouraging to her. And she definitely says, that both men and women helped her, but she definitely acknowledged that, you know, sometimes that she was lucky that, that women actually helped her because a lot of times women kind of view each other as adversaries. Um, and that's something that's set up by, you know, the patriarchy, but she says that she's lucky because she really did have women in her life and not necessarily black women, women of, you know, both white women and black women who really did, take her under their wing and like really help her and really show her. And, um, oh, and, and, and the sad part, one, a sad part is like, um, in the epilogue of the book, she had kind of like a postscript and her dad ended up passing away of COVID, which was so sad. And she was, you know, she was very close to her dad. And so, yeah, her dad just, died like last year while she was writing this book. And so she, she, um, that it, and it was kind of sad that this had to be the end of her book because it was such an uplifting motivational book. And then, you know, at the end it was basically like, you know, fuck COVID because, you know, fuck COVID, which I agree. Yeah. Fuck COVID. But it was just, it was just sad, though. It was just sad because she was very close to her dad. And her dad actually sounded like... Actually, both of her parents sounded like cool parents. And that's pretty much it. 
I highly recommend this book. As a matter of fact, I think, and I honestly think, I think, because I got it on Audible, I think I'm going to listen to this book again. Because it was really good. And um, it was really good. And I think this is the first book on this podcast that I actually was not only thoroughly entertained. I actually have some, you know, have some takeaways from this book that I can actually use to put towards my real life and to help myself make improvements. And so thank you, Bevy. So yes, get this book. I highly recommend it. And that is it. That is all. Oh, I have something. Speak. You know what? I'm tr- I'm still getting good at this podcasting solo thing because there's something else that I forgot. For those of you who don't know, I am actually a I'm I am a podcaster, but I'm also a writer and I'm also an actor. And I have a show that I have a brand new show that I am going to be per- be performing, and I would love for you all to come. So I'm now finding the information on this. So the show is called The Real Black Swan. And it is the story, it is a one-man show that I wrote. And it is a story about William Dorsey Swan, uh, who was the first black drag queen. He started in the 1800s. He was a former slave who became a drag queen. And not only uh, was he the first drag queen, he was the first openly LGBT person to um, ever, um, to protest, to ever protest. And so uh, I'm going to be doing a festival called the Rogue Festival in, uh, in Fresno, California. And so I would love for you to check out my show. So the show is called... The Real Black Swan, Confessions of America's First Black Drag Queen. And I'm going to be performing this show at the Rogue Festival, but it's going to be online, so it's going to be virtual, so you can get the show on Zoom. And um, my show dates are Saturday, March 6th at 2 p.m. Pacific Time, and Friday, March 12th, at 9 p.m. Pacific Time. Once again, The Real Black Swan, Confessions of America's First Black Drag Queen, starring Les Kirkendall Barrett. And you can get them, uh, uh, the dates are uh, Saturday, March 6th at 2 p.m. Pacific Time, and Saturday, Mar- or Friday, Friday, March 12th at... Uh, at 9 p.m. Pacific time. If you want to get a ticket, you can check out the website at www.fresnorogue.com. That is www.fresnorogfestival.com. And I'm going to even spell it for you. www.fresnorogfestival.com. And rogue is spelled R-O-G-U-E. And that's it. So please get tickets. Come see my work. I would love for you to see my work. If you would like to get a hold of me, you can send me an email at therealityreadingrainbow at gmail.com. And please feel free to suggest books. Because if you suggest the book, I will read it. We've got a lot of fun books coming up, and all of the books that we have coming up are all listener suggestions. So keep the suggestions coming. You can also check out my website at uh, leskirkendallbarrett.com. And I already mentioned about the Patreon. So yeah, if you, if you feel the urge to throw some bucks in my Patreon, feel free and there are some perks. But like I said earlier, if you don't have the bucks, I would much rather you listen to the show. And what else? Oh, 
um, please give me a review on whatever platform that you listen to me on. And a five-star review would be absolutely lovely. And that is it. So until next time, keep reading. Bye.